Welcome to CS642 Computer Security. We're going to be talking today about two more IP security issues. One is fragmentation of IP packets, and the second one is denial of service attacks, in particular networking telescopes, to measure how often those attacks are. So we'll start off with a closer look at IP fragmentation. So the reason we have this is that every network has some maximum transmission unit, or MTU, which says how many bits is the largest amount it can carry as one unit, or one packet. So what happens if you send a packet from one network to another network that have different maximum transmission units? Well, a router is allowed to split a packet into multiple fragments if the packet size exceeds the destination link's maximum transmission unit. This is the, al the alternative would be to drop the packet, which would make it hard to connect. However, this means that somebody must reassemble these fragments to recover the original packet. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have a 4,000 byte packet that crosses a link with an MTU of 1,500 bytes. So when the packet comes in, it's going to be 4,000 bytes, and at some point it has to be fragmented into packets that are less than 1,500 bytes. So here we have the original packet, which has a 20-byte IP header and a 3,980-byte payload. When it gets fragmented, we can make a 1,500-byte packet with a 20-byte header and a 1,480-byte payload. We can then sort of choose how big we want the second packet to be. In this case, we use 1,200 bytes of data and a 20-byte header. Then we're left with a final packet of 1,300 bytes of data and another 20-byte header. So once we send these to the destination, the question is, what should the destination do? Should it pass these IP packets up as separate packets to the next level, or should it reassemble them? Well, the reason to reassemble is to think about what does the higher level expect. It's expecting an IP packet um, with a large payload instead of multiple small packets. Um, what it really wants is something big. And the reason is to think about what happens to the other data in this packet. So if we have a TCP header, um, you know, a, a higher level protocol like TCP will expect to see its header at the start and then an HTTP header after that. If we don't reassemble, then these things are missing from the following IP packets. This means that the receiving host has to reassemble fragmented IP packets before they're passed on to higher level protocols. So there's a few considerations here, which is where to reassemble, what happens if fragments get lost, what happens if fragments follow different paths, which means they could be reordered, or what happens if fragments can get fragmented again. We need a protocol that it can allow that. So let's start by looking at where should assembly occur. It could be happening in, a, in the next uh, router in the network where the, there's a bigger MTU size, but here we apply the end-to-end -end principle that says we really want to do all these things at the end host. If we do it at the next top router, the next top router has some complex reassembly algorithm. It has to hold on to state to buffer fragments. Uh, whereas routers have very expensive memories and, and handle requests from lots of people. Um, furthermore, doing it any other router may not work because fragments may take different paths. So if we fragment, if we reassemble someplace else, we might not have all the fragments available at that place to do reassembly. This means that there's little benefit and a large cost of doing reassembly in the network. So instead, reassembly is always done at the destination. So in reassemble, what fields should we put in an IP packet to make reassembly work? We need a way to identify the fragments in the packet, so we're going to introduce an identifier so that we know that all the fragments are related. What if the fragments get lost? So we need to sort of know what the fragments refer to, so we have some kind of sequence number or offset that says how the fragments are related. Now in choosing in terms of a sequence number or offset, how do I know if I have them all? So for example, if I fragment and I have different sequence numbers, um, if one gets lost, what happens? M. So a sequence number would need for that. We need to have some maximum sequence number to know how many there are. But we also have to worry about refragmentation. So we may have a packet with a fragment with a sequence number that gets fragmented again. We have to know we get both of those. So this leads us to wanting to use an offset instead of just saying what offset and how many bytes do we have. So let's look now at the IPv4 fragmentation fields. So there's an identifier which says what sort of identifies this packet uniquely, and this is how we know all the fragments belong to the same original packet. We then have some fragmentation control fields. We have a reserved field, which we don't use. We have a don't fragment bit that says, don't fragment this block, this packet. Instead, send an error message back, uh, or drop it, or send an error message back. Um, this can be used to control fragmentation at the sender side if we want to control that. MF is set in a flag if it, there's more fragments coming. This says that it's not the last fragment in a packet. Um, expect something. So here is the IP packet structure. Um, so in there we're going to have this 16-bit identification field, three bits of flags, and a 13-bit fragment offset. 
So why this works is that any fragment without, without the uh, more fragments bit is the last fragment. This tells the host that these are the last bits in the original payload. Any other fragment that does have the more fragments bit set, uh, fill in the holes in that. So the host, when it sees a, a fragment without the amp bit, knows to allocate that much space, and it knows to keep on assembling all the various fragments, whatever order they come in, using the offset field to fill in the complete uh, packet. So why not use, why not add a number for each fragment? The reason is that if we fragment a fragment, then we'll have sort of smaller fragments that cover smaller uh, sort of intermediate offsets with smaller lengths that we can still reassemble by knowing exactly where each piece goes. So here's an example. Suppose we have this packet. We're going to split it into three pieces as we did before. Um, so this is what the original packet looked like. We had a checksum. We had an identification field. We have our original bits. Our offset is zero. When we um, fragment it, here's a possible first bit. So here we have um, a more fragment bit is set to one, a fragment offset is zero, and our total length is 1500, and we computed a new checksum. Our second fragment, um, or fragment number one, is the next piece. It has an offset of 185, which means it's bytes 1480, a total length of 1220, and we have the more fragment bit set, and again, a new checksum. And then our final fragment here has total length 1320, fragment offset is 335 times eight bytes is 2680, here we set the more fragment bit to zero, and we calculate a new checksum, and the receiver now knows that it has the complete packet. So that's how fragmentation works, and again, it's used when you're traversing networks with different maximum transmission unit sizes or different packet lengths. So let's now look at the security implications. So one of the things this can do is it can allow for evasion of networking monitoring and enforcement, um, because we can split a packet across multiple fragments. This means that if a packet inspection looks for a signature, for example, it looks at the shell code that you generated for homework one, it can see the packets don't match that because they only have a fragment of it. So suppose, for example, we have at offset zero, we have you know some nasty at, offset eight, we have the remainder tack bytes. Um, if you just look at any single IP packet, then it looks fine, you have to reassemble it. This means that the monitor has to actually remember um, the previous fragments and do its own reassembly. But this makes the monitor more expensive and complicated. It has to have memory, which makes it vulnerable to attack because we can exhaust that memory. Another fragmentation attack is to think about what happens if we send two packets that are overlapping or inconsistent. So suppose, for example, at offset 0, we have username. At offset 8, we have nice. And then we send another fragment at offset 8 with evil. So in this case, how does a network monitor know whether the username is nice or evil? Because it doesn't know what packet will receive by the host. These two fragments could be reordered before they get to the host and when they're delivered. And the host may have its own policy of how to, how to decide things. So this makes it hard for a monitor to know what will actually happen if they're um, inconsistent. So other fragmentation attacks are what happens if the attacker doesn't send all the fragments in a packet. This means the receiver or the firewall doing monitoring will end up holding the fragments that they do receive for a whole long time. This is called a state holding attack. Um, because it sort of uses up state space. If we send a lot of fragments, we could potentially exhaust the memory in a firewall and make it just pass packets through without analyzing them. So this sort of covers the kinds of fragmentation attacks that happen. There's another class that happen due to bugs in the implementation. For example, if the reassembly code is broken or doesn't handle overlapping fragments, you could potentially cause the machine to crash. This is what happens in the IP ping of death. So let's now go back to the denial of service attacks we talked about previously and look at more. So there's a question of how can we actually measure how big a problem denial of service is? We hear about it in the news when someone's attacked, but we don't sort of know in general how many different denial of service attacks are going on. So some researchers had a brilliant idea was that we could use this notion of backscatter to sort of see if somebody is spoofing addresses, we might be able to see when those spoofed addresses are used by seeing unexpected packets. So suppose we have an attacker at address 5.6.7 at 8 attacking the host at address 1.2.3.4 by spoofing the address 8.7.3.4. This is on the lower right. So if we look at the packets at 8.7.3.4 and there have been sort of spoofed attacks, we could see some unexpected packets that the server 1234 generated that 8.7.3.4 wasn't expecting. So by measuring how many packets there are there and what kinds of packets they are, we can actually learn something about what attacks are going on. Now, we can't tell who is launching them. We can just sort of measure how frequent they are. 
So when we look at floods, we can sort of see there's some signatures of responses that the victim will send that the host 8734 will receive unexpectedly. So if we send a SYN packet to an open port, this might be a SYN flood, we'll see a SYN ACK response. If it's a SYN to a closed port, we'll see a RST response. Um, if we send a TCB ACK, we'll get a RST response. A data will get an RST response um, because they're all not expected. If we send an RST as an attack, there'll be no response. So you can see there'll be a whole set of different responses that we might expect. So by measuring how often these things happen, we can actually see what happens. So there is a group in California called CADA that does this, and they monitor what happens for very large ranges of addresses. So they can see, for example, for um, addresses, a slash 16 address, which is a whole 65,000 different host addresses, what happens. And they could measure in 2001, there are about 400 SYN attacks per week that they could measure. In 2008, it had gone up by a factor of 10. Um, uh, by a factor of 70, so they were getting more than 4,000 attacks in 24 hours. So in 2017, they looked at an idle machine to sort of see what is an idle machine received, and they realized that about 8% of the packets it received is UDP pack scatter. About 16% are UDP port scans looking for vulnerable addresses. They see ICMP back scatter is about 1%, ICMP scans for vulnerable code is 2%. TCP backscatter, all those TCP, RST, SYN, ACK packets are 7%. And then about 75% of it is TCP, 68% is TCP scans where people are looking for open services. So this is a machine that no one is connecting to and should never be received, really should receive no traffic at all, but is being constantly bombarded. Um, we can also look at the uh, cumulative density function of attack sizes to see sort of what is the rate of attacks. And we can see that, um, you know, something like 90% of attacks are less than 10 to the fifth packets per second. And we can look at how long attacks take. So about 90% um, of attacks last less than 10 to the five uh, minutes. And so this tells us how often attacks are. So one final thing is what can we do against an ALP service attacks? You know, fundamentally, if we can't stop them, we have to tolerate them. And this is the most, then there's an offset that says what portion of the original payload this fragment, con fragment contains. And it's an eight byte, it's uh, in eight byte units, so we don't need quite as many bits to, to store this because we're only keeping track of fragments in eight um, byte units.